Oh, glorious to the Sambo devotees. Oh, glorious to Sri Guru and Garanga. Oh, glorious to Sri Prabhupada. Namo and Vishnu Padaya. Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale. Sri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamani. Namaste Sarasati Devi. Gold of Ani Bacharya Ne. Nirvasesha Sunyavadi Pasta Chadi Shatadi. The song of Bhakti Vinod Sakura. O venerable Vaishnava, O ocean of mercy, be merciful unto your servant. Give me the shade of your lotus feet and purify me. I hold on to your lotus feet. Teach me to control my six passions, rectify my six faults. Bestow upon me the six qualities and offer unto me the six kinds of holy association. If you would like to find out what they are, if you don't know or if you know, you can also look. You have to read today the Nectar of Instruction or Sri Upide Shamrit. Um, and there you will find the first four verses. That little book of Rupa Goswami describes these six passions, etc. I do not find the strength to carry on alone the Sankirtan of the holy name of Hari. Please bless me by giving me just one drop of faith with which to obtain the great treasure of the holy name of Krishna. Krishna is yours. You have the power to give him to me. <clears throat> I am simply running behind you, shouting, Krishna, Krishna. Song. Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj particularly emphasized the songs of Naratam Das and Bhakti's own father, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, which dealt with the process of Vaidhi Bhakti. He was opposed to the public singing of songs which delved into the <coughs> confidential aspects of Radha and Krishna's pastimes. They were reserved for elevated souls in specific situations. And he would stop devotees on many occasions for singing inappropriately. He would also stop them sometimes when he could see they were singing for their own sense gratification. <clears throat> or they were this, this, this extended chanting of the the names on and on and on he would stop this one time he said you've taken five minutes to chant one Maha Mantra you could have chanted ten times in that period of time or more he wasn't into this showy business <coughs> So today we're going to try to speak a few words about the teachings, the glories of Srila Prabhupada's spiritual master, after the Prabhupada's spiritual master, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Maharaj, Srila Prabhupada. And <coughs> the Paramaguru, and here also he's known sometimes as the Acharya's son, who brought the message of Krishna consciousness all over greater India and beyond, sending his disciples to the Western world. It's nice to note that Bhakti Vinod Thakur 
the father of the Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, who sent literature to the Western world. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj sent disciples to the Western world. And our spiritual <coughs> master, Srila Prabhupada himself, personally came to the Western world. Things were being prepared for the prediction which Bhakti Vinod had made um, in the 1880s that very soon a great personality will appear in this world, maybe even the 90s, who will fulfill this prediction that in every town and village the holy name will be heard and chanted. And Western people, white people, will be taking up this Sankirtan in their towns and streets with banners, <coughs> madungas, cartels, singing the holy names of Krishna. And they will come to Mayapur and they will embrace their Bengali brothers and together they will chant, to please accept us, and together they will chant Jai Sachinan, glorifying Chaitanya Maha. He predicted that day will come. Then he said, very soon a great personality will come to fulfill this prediction. Who will go all over the world, unrestrictedly, fearlessly, spreading this Sankirtan. So actually it was in the early 90s. And shortly after that, Er Sri Prabhupada appeared in the world to take this prediction and spread this uh, message all over the world. It's still going on. So his Acharya's son, in the darkness of this age of Kali, where even in the line of Vaishnavas, so much corruption and deviation was rampant. In the West, there was no idea of Vaishnavism hardly. And in India, so many deviations and concoctions and so on. The people's Consciousness was covered in varieties of illusion and darkness. But he, you could say, enlightened, brought this light into people's lives. What is the true nature of devotional service? What is the true nature of the living entity in eternity? He was also known as a ray of Vishnu. Um, and we'll come on to that a little bit more. And the Vaikuntha man, Prabhupada called him Vaikuntha man. One time Sri Ashura Prabhupada asked, could he speak something about his Guru Maharaj? And he said, what can I say? He is a Vaikuntha man. Unlimited. There's no limit to his character, qualities, etc. He's a Vaikuntha man. Singer Guru. We'll hear more about that later. We'll start with some Mangala Sharma. This is Srila Prabhupada's own um, prayers to his spiritual master in his Gita Gan, a little Bengali book which published a long, long time ago. And Prabhupada wrote a little, little prayer in the beginning there. Shri Guru Vandana Kori Tanhar Charan Adore Shri Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada Harayata Siksha Guru Sabevancha Kalpa Toru Kripa Kara Kuchuka Visha I offer obeisances unto my spiritual master Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada and take hold of his lotus feet and unto my various Siksha Gurus who are all like desire trees I pray please be merciful and remove all of my sorrows and then the traditional prayers which we offer respects for obeisances to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj you can chant together if you wish. Nama O Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhuraya 
I offer my respectful obeisances unto his divine grace, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, who is very dear to Lord Krishna, having taken shelter at his lotus feet. Shri Varshabhanavi Devi Daitaya Kripabdaye Krishna Sambandha Vigyana Darine Prabhupada Namaha I offer my respectful obeisances to Sri Varsha Banavi Devi Daita Das, another name of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, we'll hear about that later, who is favoured by Srimati Radharani and who is the ocean of transcendental mercy and the deliverer of the science of Krishna. Madhuryoshvala Premadhyam Shri Rupano Shri Gora Karuna Shakti Vigrahaya I offer my respectful obeisances unto you, the personified energy of Sri Chaitanya's mercy, who delivers devotional service, which is enriched with conjugal love of Radha and Krishna, coming exactly in the line of revelation of Srila Rupa Goswami. Namaste Gauravani Shimutaye Dinataine Rupanuva Virudatta Siddhanta Dvanta Harine I offer my respectful obeisances unto you, who are the personified teachings of Lord Chaitanya. You are the deliverer of the fallen souls. You do not tolerate any statement which is against the teachings of devotional service enunciated by Srila Rupa Goswami. And we'll then just read one more invocation, you could say. Okay, this is intuitive. In 1936, his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, delivered this poem as a Vyasa Puja homage for his divine grace, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. So, as today is his appearance day, it's appropriate to read Srila Prabhupada, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada's Vyasa Puja homage to his divine grace, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Maharaj. This is the homage. I hope you can read it. It's a little small. Adore, adore ye all the happy days, blessed in heaven, sweeter than a name. When he appeared at Puri, the holy place, my Lord and Master, his divine grace. O oh, my Master, the evangelic angel, give us thy light, light up thy candle. Struggle for existence, a human race, the only hope is divine grace. <coughs> Misled we are all going astray, save us, Lord, our fervent pray. Wonder thy ways to turn our face, adore thy feet, your divine grace. Forgotten Krishna, we fallen souls, pay most heavy the illusions tall. Darkness around, all untraced, the only hope is divine grace. Message of service thou hast brought, a healthful life as Chaitanya wrought, unknown to all. It's full of grace, that's your gift, your divine grace. <coughs> this particular verse, the next one, is very special to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj. He requested this poem to be put into this regular newspaper, English newspaper, which he would publish regularly about Krishna. And this particular line was very important to him. 
absolute is sentient, thou hast proved impersonal calamity, thou hast moved. This gives us a life anew and fresh. Worship thy feet, your divine grace. <laughs> Had you not come who had told the message of Krishna, forceful and bold, that's your right, you have the mace. Save me, you have fallen, your divine grace. The line of service is drawn by you, is pleasing and healthy like morning dew. The oldest of all been who dress. Miracle done, your divine grace. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Shila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Maharaj, Shila Prabhupada Ki. Absolute sentient thou hast proved in personal calamity thou hast moved or removed. This line is very, very important for Bhakti Siddhanta because practically the whole world is infected with impersonalism. Mayavad philosophy. And this is one of the major many majors in his life. Major aspect of his preaching was to debunk Mayavad philosophy. Even Mayavadis are chanting Hare Krishna. They're glorifying, so-called glorifying Krishna with impersonal intent to remove Krishna from the picture ultimately. Modern day cheating religions are also saturated with Mayavad philosophy, claiming the Guru is God, God has no form, has no name, etc. All varieties of Mayavad influence. Not to speak of the direct Mayavad understanding that we're all God. This is the prominent religion. Atheism, of course, is becoming even more prominent, but there's not that much difference in science. <coughs> prominent philosophies of this age, the only religion that people happily embrace, because devotional service, the, the real eternal sanatan dharma of the soul um, requires surrender. And that is a very bad word in many people's hearts. I didn't come here to surrender. Why should I surrender to anyone? Not very common, not very popular you could say. But we'll get back to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj. And in our short time we'll try to speak a few glories of His Divine Grace. And we'll try to, well, of course we'll forget many things, we forget more or less everything. There will be mistakes, and I beg your forgiveness or correction as and when required, and we hope by your blessings we can speak a few words of worth. And Bhakti, as we mentioned briefly, the Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj was, took birth in 1874 on February the 6th at 3.30 in the afternoon. So how many years ago is that? Now what are we, 2021? That's 147 years, is that right? Somebody can do a quick measure. I think it's 147 years ago. Maybe wrong. So very soon we'll be coming up to the 150th anniversary of his appearance, which will be a very big festival. And he was born. Who knows where he was born? Puri! Where's Puri? Yes, you're right. 
My word, what did you guess? In Orissa, very holy place of Lord Jagannath. Lord Jagannath. I was reading, I guess this morning, last night, whatever. Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj said to his disciples in England, if you can go to every village in England and establish deities of Jagannath Baladev Sabhadra and Lord Chaitanya and distribute our traditional foodstuffs, prasadam, the foodstuffs we have, you know, rice, dal, sabji, listen that, in everywhere in England, he said, the English people will be converted. <laughs> He wanted to have a Rathiatra pestle, he wrote. A Rathiatra, because Lord Jagannath, you know, he goes on his Rathiatras, sometimes to the ocean and in some places. But he wanted it to go from London to was it Eastbourne, I think it was. Eastbourne, a, a, a holiday resort in the south coast of England. English people thought Eastbourne was a suburb of London. It was about 70 miles away. So, you know, if you haven't been there, you think it's like, because all the London people go there for their holidays. <laughs> Brighton and these crazy places. So he had these ideas to preach to the Westerners. When he was born, his mother, Bhagavati Devi, that's is a picture of his mother. She had about 13 kids. <laughs> Too much. Not enough. <laughs> He had a lot of children. One devotee's grandmother had 23. One devotee's grandmother had 23. Amazing. Congratulations to her. <laughs> I was in Malaysia one time. I was in a house of one disciple. was with Jayapataka Maharaj in one disciple in his disciple's house one time. We were talking. And uh, one of the boys was initiated by Jayapataka Maharaj. His father was also initiated. And then two or three others got initiated in the family. And he asked the, the, the son, this one's name was Kirtan, said, how many children are you? He said, 15. Oh. Oh my God. And Jeeva Takamaya wh whispered in my ear, at last an honest disciple. <laughs> said, an honest disciple. So you can work that one out. <laughs> so anyway, 13 children, the first one passed away. Bhakti Siddhanta was the fourth son of Bhagavati. Bhakti Vinod, his father, had another wife previously, and she passed away. There was another child from that wife as well. They're a big family, and uh, they were born, he was born, he was born, because at that time Bhakti Vinod was magistrate in Puri, in the court. And he had a house on what's called Grand Road. Grand Road, if you've been to Puri, it is a Grand Road. Very grand. It's one of the widest, and I think at one time it was the widest road, you know, urban road in the world. Very wide. I don't know how many, 100 meters? I don't know. It's very, very wide. Acres. Uh, the road's very big. And that's where Ra Lord Jagannath Rathiatra goes along from the Jagannath Temple to the Gundicha Mandir Temple, on Rathiatra. And millions of people crowd the streets. No one's really know how many, it's just countless people. The street's very wide. When Bhakti Siddhanta was born, he was born with a, you know what the umbilical cord is from the mother to the child? This cord comes from the mother to the you know, to the belly button, so to speak. Umbilical cord. And that was wrapped around his neck as he came out the womb, just like a Brahmin thread. Exactly like a Brahmin thread. Very really mystical. And uh, his father didn't wear the Brahmin thread. It wasn't considered very significant in terms of devotional service. So he cast Brahmins kind of a, a ritualistic, hereditary thing, birth, so not held very important by Gaudiya Vaishnavas. And when he was born, the astrologer came, and this is what the astrologer, I think it's what he said, 
Yeah, this is what the astrologer said. I have done many horoscopes in my life, but I have never seen, never before seen such a horoscope filled with all the, the signs of a great personality. This child will become world famous as a brilliant teacher of life's ultimate goal. That was the prediction he made when he was born. The astrologer. You generally don't get such a prediction. Very good. Mukta Purush, she had all the 32 symptoms of a pure soul. In his form, in his time of birth, everything. And he was given by his father, Bhimala Prasad, they named him the, the, in Jagannath Puri, all the offerings of Lord Jagannath are offered to Bhimala Devi, a form of Yoga Maya, you could say, internal potency of the Lord. She always gets the remnants of the Lord first before anyone else gets it. So that's Bhimala Prasad. So they gave him the name Bhimala Prasad. And he was an extraordinary child. And, and after six months, when he was six months old, Bhimala Prasad was just a baby in his mother's lap. The Rathi, less than six months, the Rathi Atra festival took place. And along the grand road came the chariots of Lord Jagannath Baladev Sabhadra and right in front of Bhakti Vinod Thakur's house Lord Jagannath stopped. The cart could not move an inch. And this happens some regularly. Somehow or another, mystically speaking, the cart doesn't move. Stop there. And because Bhagavati is the wife of the magistrate, she was, was Wife is a very important person. Actually, no, Bhaktivinoda, in the British regime, he was only one of three Indians who were given this title in the whole of India. One of three. A big post. Head magistrate, basically, in Arista, that's what it meant. Big post. And so the cart stopped in front of his house, and Bhagavati brought the baby out. And went up on top of the chariot. The steps were there. And she took the baby up and placed the baby at the foot of Lord Jagannath. And what should happen? One of Lord Jagannath's garlands fell onto the child. Considered to be extremely auspicious. And on the chariot, Bhagavati performed what we call Anaprasana. And a prasana ceremony. And we do it here sometimes when the child receives the first grains. First grains. So there, Bhakti Bhimala Prasad received the first grains, which were Mahaprasad from Lord Jagannath. That was his first grains, directly from Lord Jagannath. And then they performed this little, let's say, Test of the child's proclivities, what is likely Varna should be, putting various items in front of the child. And uh, the Bhagavatam and maybe some coins and a few other items indicative of a particular nature of the child. At that stage, their tendencies generally manifest into what they become attracted with in no time. The baby grabbed the Bhagavatam and held it to his chest like this. Clearly obvious what his inclinations are. He grew up and he was uh, quite an extraordinary child. Now, regarding the, another name of, uh, uh, well, not a name, and an address of Bhimla Prasad later on, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, of course was uh, Raya Vishnu, I mean, in English you say Raya Vishnu, but it's not Sanskrit. But uh, it's stated that Bhakti Vinod Thakur, his father, who had started to re-establish the true teachings of Lord Chaitanya, or started a revolution. Now it's interesting, this word revolution is common here in France, huh? You know what it means? 
originally. We don't use it for its original meaning. We use it now to make, you know, turn over, you know, get rid of the something and start something new, you know. <laughs> but you know what it means? It means to return things to their origin, origin. To bring things back to their origin. So he was really, Bhaktivinoda was a revolutionary. And Bhaktisiddhanta, all the Vaishnavas are revolutionaries, really, the real revolutionaries. Not this constant change based upon our own you know, self-centered philosophy, but taking it to the original philosophy of the absolute truth, which is the real revolution, and a society which facilitates that goal. <coughs> revolution. So Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was known as the uh, Bhakti Vinod was praying for a ray of Vishnu to try to fulfill Ray of Vishnu, Lord Vishnu, Supreme Lord, one of his own personal men come into this world to assist him in moving towards us. So when Bhimla Prasad was born it was considered he was that, or is that, ray of Vishnu, whom Bhaktivinoda had been praying for. So that's the ray of Vishnu. And as a child, he was a, a brilliant child, a unique child. He said, sometimes you see that in children there, the head seems to be a lar large in proportion to the body, especially the forehead. This is generally a sign of a highly intelligent person, generally. When we're born, you know, with a peanut head and a, you know, <laughs> elephant body. <laughs> She's like an insect, you know. See the insects, they have like mustard seed heads and this big fat body. <laughs> it's not always an indication, but it's usually it's and he was very brilliant, and, you know, he, he was known as Shrutidhar when he shared his life. Shrutidhar means one who has a photogenic memory. I'm sure many of us here have photogenic memories, right? Yes. We're always taking pictures on our mobiles, that they're photogenic. <laughs> then we remember to take a picture. <laughs> Not exactly. He could, it's said that he could remember, just by hearing something once he would remember it. He wouldn't forget it. He could read a page and remember everything on that page. Tell you the page number of it. I said, these great souls, they're able to achieve unbelievable things. And he wrote one text, uh, Vaishnav Manjusha. The text on all, you know, aspects of Vaishnavism and so on and so forth. And great personalities. All like a dictionary of Vaishnavism. Encyclopedia of Vaishnavism. I don't know if it's ever been translated into English, I've never seen it. I don't know if it's even available anymore. But he wrote this in some period of time, I can't remember exactly, in the 8th, I don't know when he wrote it, 90s, I don't know when he wrote it, anyway, whenever. He wrote it, and a uh, great scholar, one of the topmost scholar in Calcutta said, this is impossible what he's done. He said, he had like something like, 16 scribes writing for, you know, years and years on end, they would never be able to put this together. It's just such a voluminous, monumentous task. He had these, like his father, empowered to do incredible things, which a normal person could not. Just like a Prabhupada also producing so many books in such a short time at his age, doing dozens of other things at the same time. So here he is, uh, it's pretty much the same picture. That I think that's my uncle or something, one of his family members. That's not his father, it's someone else. But that's a couple of more of his brothers there in the picture. And young man, and there he is, a family shot. Huh? That is one of the family shots. It's not a complete shot. It is uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur in the middle and Bhagavati on the right. And who can guess where Bhakti Siddhanta arrives? Which one's Bhakti Siddhanta? Who knows? Don't, who knows? Which one? Huh? Garangi? Garangi, loud and clear.
Top left. Top left hand side, the one that on the very left hand mm -hmm. side, sitting there in a slight mm -hmm. angle with the moustache. But Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he was quite strict with his children. And he said at one time, he said, if you don't help me in my mission, you can go somewhere else for your lunch. Yeah. There were no McDonald's in those days. Thank God. You have to go somewhere else for your lunch. Yeah. You have to go to New Mayapur. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter what we do here, you can take your lunch here. <laughs> yeah, you know, devotional service is, is a, a great secret. In one sense. They're taking prasad, it's wonderful. Many things coming for festivals, all very wonderful. But we're here to go a little bit further than just that. We're here to understand what the essential nature of the soul is. To give up all desire for one's own self-satisfaction. To satisfy the senses of Krishna. And that's family shots. Here's a picture of him as a young man. I mean, he grew up. And he said that by the age of seven he memorized the Bhagavad Gita very easily and was, was you know, speaking from it regularly. And the school, everything. He even wrote his own shorthand by the age of thirteen. Yeah, this shorthand means, you know, when you have language you find a way of saying it in very shorthand, in just a few syllables or a few letters or something to so you can very quickly dictate when someone speaks. He wrote his own one. Uh, when he was a youth, he, of course, he was very scholarly. He studied astronomy, astrology, other topics too, besides all the books of his father, which were his main, as this quote here says, my life is for the single-minded cultivation of the teachings of Sri Chaitanya, not for the cultivation of grammar. I have only studied the Vedas, the branches of the Vedas, and their related parts in a secondary manner. He would study his father's books like anything, and still he would always get everything perfect in his exams at school, etc. Because he'd just hear it once, and that was enough. Uh, we have to study it and cram it in, repeat it, and write it on the back of our hands, or uh, pound, hoping that no one sees it there. <laughs> He didn't care for all these things. He went through it. He had debating clubs, the August Assembly, when he was studying at college with other students studying, and debating philosophies. He studied philosophers of the world. Why? For the future, for his preaching mission. And he knew what other people were talking about. Our Prabhupada, Actually, Prabhupada states that from childhood he was a strict brahmachari. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Maharaj. And he underwent very severe penances for starting this movement, worldwide movement. That was his mission. A brahmachari, you all know what a brahmachari is, right? Somebody who's spaced out, wears orange, <laughs> <laughs> can't get married, you know. Um, too lazy to work. <laughs> what other? Sing songs. Sing songs. Yeah. Hangs around the temple waiting for prasadam. On. <laughs> what else does Brahmachari do? They go up and Oh, they go on sang and sometimes if someone asks them to go. Like all the parish. Yeah. Well, that's not really a Brahmachari. Yeah. So Brahmachari, it's, you know. Huh? Supposed to work very hard. He's the supposed leg. to work very hard. Represents the legs. Menial. Yeah, the legs of society. Well, it's good yeah, to legs of society. Knowledge. Huh? Good yeah, to cultivating know. knowledge. One who's on the path of Brahman, studying under the direction of a spiritual master, Guru. <coughs> and menial servant to spiritual master. Menial. Menial. Whatever they say. They don't eat unless the spiritual master calls them. That's the injunction. Strict. Prasadam time. Otherwise, they fast. 
So you don't get many like that. But Prabhupada didn't expect that. Bhakti Siddhantama, and also they are celibate. Celibate. That means, it doesn't just mean they don't have a girlfriend. It means they never pass semen. So who on earth can we say is in that category now? Very rare. He said he never passed semen once in his life. Sometimes people say this will make you mad. <laughs> yeah, modern philosophers. Many times they say you'll go crazy if you... Mm. And you will in a sense because people are so lusty and they, you know, that they go mad because they can't control their lust. Um, but he never... It, it actually, it, it, semen, deer is very... and strong. Nourishing in the brain tissues gain strength. Power, Shakti. But he was a lifelong brahmachari. But he did say, he did say, that if I could be assured that by having children they would become pure devotees, I would have sex a hundred times or more. <laughs> the purpose of having sex life, the highest purpose, we could say, the trans. The topmost purpose is to raise children in Krishna consciousness. It's not just to release one's passions. As animal life. Dog and cats. Dog. Cats and dogs. Uh, cats and dogs. <laughs> Who is very strict like that? In fact, there's this records. I, I used to study the records. That they found that people who are they say that you go mad if you, if you don't, but they find that mad people are the ones who, more than anyone else, can't control their sexual urges. Makes you mad. So he was a great scholar. He loved to study his father's books like anything. Was life and soul. He assisted his father in publishing, editing, proofreading, collating. The many, many books published by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Magazines, newspapers, news, you know, so many literatures were being published from Bhakti Abhimala Prashad. He got the name Siddhanta Saraswati because of his expertise in studying astronomy. In astrology, the Surya Siddhanta, ancient text. And uh, yeah, because he was so good at that, he was given the name Surya Siddhanta, um, Siddhanta Saraswati. And uh, yeah, as time went on, his father wanted him to get initiated. Traditionally, the father does not give official initiation to the son. He gives siksha, but not diksha. So, who to, claim, who to send his son to for diksha? Practically, besides Bhakti Vinod Thakur, there are Vaishnavas, but not very qualified Vaishnavas. Babaji's were there, but they would not give this, they give. You know, Babaji Vesh, but that's not the type of diksha he was talking about. He was talking about the diksha line of the preachers was not being given. <coughs> there were no Gaudiya Vaishnava preachers besides Bhakti Vinod Thakur and a few of his followers. So who to go to? At that time, Jagannath Das Babaji, Vamsi Das Babaji, Gokishore Das Babaji, there were many Babajis there in Navadvip who were pure devotees but they were not externally in the, what's called the Bhagavat Marg, in the mood of preaching the message, but rather secluded worship. And not so some, but not so much preaching. But amongst them, Koti Shodas Babaji was very, uh, became very close with Bhakti Vinod Thakur, and would come to the house of Bhakti Vinod, to cut Svananda Sikhata Kunj. In Mayapur and Unavadweep, and he would come there. So, 
Bhakti Vinod could recognize he is a pure devotee, so he decided his son should take initiation from Gokeshwar Das Babaji, who was actually illiterate, means he couldn't read or write. Couldn't even sign his own signature. He was a grain dealer before he renounced his family and everything. He became a Babaji for a long time in Vrindavan. Now he'd moved to Mount Nabatweep. So Bhakti Vinod Thakur asked his son to approach him for initiation. And Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati is a great scholar. And he said himself, he said, actually I was a little proud. I had some pride in my scholarship. And he was thinking a little bit, you know, Bhakti sure is illiterate, you know. There was a little tinge of this there, he said, maybe to teach us. So he approached uh, Gokishwar Das Babaji uh, one time, and uh, Gokishwar Das Babaji actually said, no, no, no. He said, I had one disciple before, but he cheated me. <laughs> he said he left. He decided never to have one again. <laughs> he said, these disciples are just cheap. And he begged and begged, and uh, he said, and the said, well, I'll have to ask Mahaprabhu. <laughs> I'll have to ask Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. I can't do it. So come back after some days. So back to Siddhanta Saraswati, Siddhanta Saraswati at that time. Went to home to his father and his father. So what happened? He told him what happened. He said, Okay, go back again. So he went back again a few days later and fell at the feet of Gorky Shore. Babaji. And said, Ude, did you, did you ask Mahaprabhu? Did you ask Mahaprabhu? <laughs> oh, I forgot. <laughs> I forgot to ask him. Come back again after a few days. I'll see you. When I next see him, I'll ask him. Went home. Back to the and said, "Look, if you don't get in the stage at this time, don't come home." <laughs> Pretty heavy. So he went this time, desperately determined, determined. And he got found Gorky Shodas Babaji, whatever, boot here, falling, falling at his feet, begging him, "Did you ask Mahaprabhu?" Uh, yes, yes, I asked him. What did he say? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because then Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj started crying and crying. I'm so unfortunate, so proud of my scholarship. To hell with all this scholarship. If I cannot get shelter at your lotus feet, and then he started saying, Guru Dev, Krika Bindu Dia. He was crying and crying, he said, my life is useless, I will give up my life and I cannot accept your shelter. So eventually he agreed. And there are different reports. We've got the name Bhakti, Bhakti Siddhanta. And sometimes it's said he was given the name Sri Barshabhanavi Devi Dayataya at that time as well. Das. And sometimes it's said at another time he was given. But anyway, whatever, he received both those names. Bhakti Siddhanta, Bhakti Siddhanta, not just Siddhanta, Bhakti Siddhanta and Sri Barsha Banavi Devi Dayatai. Um, he was named Radharani. And uh, he was given instructions. Gorky sure gave him instructions. Don't accept any disciples, he told him. Don't accept any disciples. <laughs> Never associate with anyone but pure devotees. <laughs> devotees, at least. And uh, don't associate with the worldly people, basically, he said. Just don't associate at all with worldly people. And don't go to any, don't go to Calcutta. At least for a bit. Koki <laughs> Shore had this thing about Calcutta. <laughs> Jai Patakamaraj, one time, he told us that when he was first in, 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 in Mayapur, in the early 71, he was learning Bengali. And there was one Bengali farmer, he was trying to 
practice his Bengali with him. And he didn't know he knew something. He asked the man in very simple language, uh, had he ever been to Calcutta? <laughs> this farmer. And he said, I went there once, an old man, but I would <laughs> never ever go there again. He asked nice him why. Why? You will not believe what I saw in Calcutta. <laughs> I saw a man holding a woman's hand in the street. I will never go to that sinful place ever again, he said. <laughs> Can you imagine? I don't think he's ever been to Paris. <laughs> <laughs> or even New Mayapur, maybe. <laughs> But uh, go to shore. The Babaji, they, they get into these things. So, how to follow such an instruction? Oh, yeah. He also gave him the instruction to preach. Pretty difficult. Well, he followed all three. Very strictly. He never made any disciples. So, the Guru doesn't make disciples. He accepts service. He's, the disciple is the guru. He sees the disciple as a guru to whom I'm to serve. One who thinks that they have made disciples is not a guru, but a, what is he? Guru. Guru. Like an animal. <laughs> Cow. Don't make disciples. It's just... The Lord sends people to for the devotees to serve. Oh, that's why Prabhupada's, some of Prabhupada's disciples called him Guru. Guru. <laughs> Prabhupada was, he gave his example. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not an animal. He <laughs> said, <laughs> my disciples, he called him Guru. Guru. Well, I'm not talking Guru. Are you calling me Guru? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, and... Uh, he didn't associate with mundane people because associate with mundane people means you interact on a familiar platform with their mundane lives. He didn't do. He just did. <coughs> Krishna, only Krishna could tell. And he never went to Calcutta because he said the Gaudiya Math is not in Calcutta. Shimbakuna. He would only go to places where there was Harikata. So that is not Calcutta. <laughs> and this way he followed. And uh, was a famous, then he went, he was where he went, he actually was engaged in different activities as librarian for the King of Tripura and various activities for various reasons, studying scriptures also when he was there. But at various mother would request his father. His father had sent him away at one time also from Puri because it was this Radharaman Charan who was preaching um, devious uh, philosophy. Chani Hari very popular in Puri at that time. And you, you see them even today, the followers are there. Sometimes Iskand devotees have gone there and started following in their footsteps also. Nitai go Radhe Sham Hare Krishna Hare Ram. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I'm not supposed to sing that. No, it's just not a joke. The proper writes it in Chaitanya And uh, <laughs> Rasa Bas, inappropriate mixtures of relationships and mixing things up inappropriately. And uh, Bhakti Notako was pointing this out. But Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj was directly challenging it and his life was threatened. So Bhakti No sent him away from Puri and he went to Mayapur. And in Mayapur, he was chanting. He made a vow to chant a billion names. And for many years, he was, not all the time, he was also doing other things. He was preaching. In fact, he accepted disciples during that period of time. Even in the presence of his own spiritual master, he accepted disciples. But there he was chanting constantly in Mayapur, in Bodhipatthana, near the Rosa Pita. He was chanting constantly, practically, day and night, and doing chato mass constantly, just eating you know, kitty off the floor, some dry things off the floor. No 
day and night chanting, 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 chanting. Then eventually, after many years, his own spiritual master said to him, should, it's okay, you know, you should also take this message you should preach. So he went, his father had moved by then to different places, and he assisted his father. And his father was, uh, back even though he was supposed to go to Midnapore for a great uh, assembly of devotees and Brahmins to discuss uh, eligibility, birth, but only a born in Brahmin, born in a Brahmin family could truly be a, a Brahmin and a proponent of the absolute truth. So there was a big debate and Bhakti Vinod was supposed to go, critical, hundreds and hundreds of pandits and Brahmins and scholars were coming. Bhakti Vinod was supposed to represent the, uh, say, the Vaishnav line of Gauranga Mahaprabhu, which doesn't depend upon birthright. But he was, by some or another, he developed a tremendous fever. And he was thinking, oh no, who will represent now the pure message of Mahaprabhu? There's no one. And the caste Brahmins and the Sahajyas, these were not even following basic principles, who take it as some kind of sense gratification that Chani Hare Krishna is for my sense gratification, of sages, etc. No one will be able to defend the pure teaching of Lord Chaitanya. And Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj's son then wrote an article, a long, long article, and presented it to his father, who was in ecstasy, seeing all the arguments, Vedic, Shastic arguments, to defeat all opposition. So he said, now I know these teachings are on the right hand. So he sent his son there, and Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj defeated, he was very expert, he started off glorifying the Brahmins. How glorious they are, quoting verse after verse, and the Brahmins were all very, very happy. And I say, the opposition party is actually our greatest supporter. So then, after that, then he started to explain the position of a Vaishnavas. And how the goal of Brahmins is to come to the platform of Vaishnavas, and if they don't, they're not qualified. And it's not based upon birth. And he was quoting verse after verse after verse that the goal is to become a pure Vaishnava. And he could, nobody, they all left, they couldn't defeat him. The whole audience was applauding. It went on and on. Anyway, a very significant event in his life. And, uh, then he came, of course, continuing to help his father. But in 1914, his father left the world. In 1915, his guru master left the world. And Vati Siddhanta was very overwhelmed. Oh, and Austin, he was struck. He said, who will there be now to chastise me, to correct me? Who is there in this world who can correct me now? He was thinking, I'm proud and so on. I need to be chastised. I need to be corrected. And he was, he went in a little bit of, you could say, internal questioning. What can I do now? How can I spread this message which I've been asked to do by my gurus? How can I do this? He's still a fairly young man, 1915, what that makes him. Well, I guess he's not so young. Uh, 74, 26, or 40 years old, I guess. Is that right? Maybe 40 years old, yeah. And uh, he was feeling a little lamenting. So we'll take it from here. He had some disciples at this time. And one time he was in the Kirtan Manda in the uh, in Mayapur, uh, near the Yoga Peak there. And he was thinking, I can't do this. Great message of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. I'm not qualified. I'm alone. I'm not qualified. And uh, there's a few things. One time, a paper just floated in to where he was. And on the paper were the cardinal instructions of Lord Chaitanya, the Goswamis, to preach, to establish deity worship, to open temples, to demonstrate the practice of devotional service and write books. Were, were there on this paper, just mystically, just appeared before him. Still, although there was some encouragement from his disciples, was it Kunja Bihari, I think, at that time, was encouraging one of his followers. 
And uh, then he, in the night, he had this vision. And this is the vision. That the Panchatattva appeared along with all of their associates. His spiritual masters appeared. The ghost swamis appeared. Don't you worry at all, he said. With supreme enthusiasm, preach the conclusion of pure devotion. In intense earnestness, chant the glories of the name. Then abode the form, attributes, associates and pastimes of Godhead at various places. All of us will help you. There is no need to worry. The support of unlimited people, countless wealth and boundless learning await the blessing of being engaged in the service of your preaching. They will be received when they are necessary. No type of worldly hindrance or danger will be able to make any obstruction for this great work of yours. We are always with you. He felt reassured. That's what their Srila Prabhupada, Rupa Goswami, came to in the Radha Damodar temple with a similar reassurance. Now one thought just came to me, I forgot one of the significant things which Prabhupada talks about in the early life of Bhakti Siddhanta and something very special. When he was a baby, just a young boy, not a baby, two years old, and his father was making a, about to make an offering of sweet mango. Now, if any of you have been in India during the mango season, you will know what that is. There are mangoes galore everywhere, and they are super ripe and super sweet and irresistible, you could say. You suck them, you make a little hole in the mango, put an ice cube in your mouth, and you suck through the hole. It's just something out of this world. Anyway, Bhakti Siddhanta at that time, Bhimala Prasad, was a little boy, he saw the mangoes, ripe mangoes sitting there, waiting for the offering, and he grabbed a mango and started to eat the mango. <gasps> His father came in and saw what was going on. What have you done? This is a great offense. You have taken that what is, which is meant for the pleasure of the Lord for your own pleasure. This is a great offense. You should never do this again. There and then, the two-year-old boy vowed he would never again eat fresh mangoes. Never. For his whole life, he would never touch a fresh mango. He would say, I am an offender. I cannot take it. But, if there are cooks around today, they may probably don't have any green mangoes anyway. But he loved green mango chutney, and he would take that green mango chutney. He liked kitchery and cuddy sauce also, by the way, very much. So he liked sandesh and rasgulas. Sometimes he said he teeth became a little rotten to excessive sandesh and rasgula. Maybe not, but that's some rumour as well. Simple. <coughs> Fried eggplant. Fried and soft turmeric like that. Different things. So he never took. So now he's getting reassured, but still, how to preach this message in the world, which is just so material, becoming, I'm thinking, how completely, unlimitedly more than then, but it appeared to be becoming very materialistic. We're in the 1916 <coughs> and 17 period. He decided it would, would take sannyas to preach the message of Krishna consciousness. People respect in India sannyasa. They don't respect you otherwise. So he decided to take sannyas, order of life. But who to take from? There's no Gaudiya Vaishnav qualified around anyone. Anyway. So he took in front of a picture of his Guru Maharaj, accepted the order of sannyas, a lowly order in terms of Babaji, humbling order, but for preaching it is necessary. So he accepted sannyas, and in 1920 he began his Gaudiya Math. He established an ashram in Calcutta, Altadang, Altadang, what's it called? Altadang, Altadangi Road. He established his first rented house there, small house there, North Calcutta. Started preaching with a few of his followers, and from there, the great mission really began. Spreading Krishna consciousness. There's a good son, yes. Wow. And in 1922, there in Altadanga Road, our spiritual master came and met his eternal guru. These are eternal associates, they're not 
ordinary living entities. It's understood that Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj's constitutional position, eternal position, it's not something we dream of or invent, but he's Naina Manjari and one of the eternal Manjaris in Rupa Goswami's line, Rupa Manjari, Kamala Manjari, Bhakti Vinod is Kamala Manjari, one of the confidential servants of Rupa Manjari, and Kamala Manjari is assisted his Nayana Manjari, who appeared as Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. They, they had their eternal forms, their Swarup, and they had their Sadhana uh, forms, Sadhaka Roop. So in this world, he's Siddhanta, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, but in the spiritual realm, Nayana Manjari. So for, for preaching, they appear. So they come because they're capable of, of bringing that light from the spiritual realm, waking us all up. Um, and I'm, I'm completely nothing, I mean, nothing can disturb them. They have complete vision of the transcendental realm. One who has seen the truth can impart that knowledge unto us. So this Prabhupada receiving those powerful instructions from his Guru Dave who told him straight away, you preach this message all over the world at their first meeting and defeated him entirely. And then Prabhupada was a little bit sympathetic towards the Indian movement and said, there's no time to wait for Indian independence. What is this nonsense? There's no independence in this world. The only independence is when we're freed of this falsity of thinking we can be independent in this world. We can't. And he's a great writer, he was writing many, following his father's footsteps, he wrote many literatures. One time, one man challenged him, he was having uh, many languages, he was producing magazines in different languages, Aryan, Hindi, Assamese, English, different Hindi, and uh, so many other, Bengali, of course, different books, magazines, etc., Harmonist, the Gaudiya, and so many, Madhu Patrika, so many different literatures were being produced. Um, regularly, weekly, somewhere weekly, somewhere daily, somewhere monthly, somewhere bi-monthly, like that. And one man said, how on earth are you producing so many literatures like this? A magazine, every day, a newspaper every day on Krishna, what do you, on earth do you think of, you can write about? It. And he said, what do you mean? How many mundane newspapers are there in this world? I don't know, so many, not so many now, people go online, but in the old days, there were millions of newspapers all over the world, different editions of this newspaper and that newspaper. Some countries had like three or four thousand different newspapers, small countries, or more. Every town had its own newspaper, two editions a day. Where I came from, a small town, had its own newspaper every day, two editions. And they did, what on earth are you writing in those newspapers about this tiny little speck called the Earth planet? You're writing millions and millions and millions of newspapers every day about this tiny little phenomenal world. He said, I could write a newspaper every second, every moment, and never say the same thing twice about Krishna. Unlimited. Unlimited. You give me the facility. Unlimited. You have only a drop of an ocean. Unlimited ocean. So limited, I understand. Great writer. There's one of his literatures, The Harmonist. There's a bit of a bit glossy, it's been glossed up a little bit there for the picture. And, of course, many, many things. He started, he will go through the judge. He, uh, he started some revolutionary preaching. He was initiating persons from all walks of life, giving sannyas to young men, initiating grihastas, ladies, men, women, everyone into Vaishnavism, Gaudiya Vaishnavism. And he started credible preaching all over India. He would send his sannyasis, especially the sannyasis, all over to preach. Now to get initiated by Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj, there was a certain requirement besides the regulated principles. What was the requirement? What did they have to do? Chant. Pardon? Yeah, that was the requirement. 64 rounds of japa. Yeah, that's too much. Many rounds of each round, I don't know. It's too, he said, it's too much. What is this? Where are you coming from? It's too much, he said. 
He gave 64 rounds. Now, most of his disciples were not necessarily able to maintain 64 rounds. Especially their grihastas, you know. You know what it's like being a grihasta, some of you? Working. One grihasta went to him one day and said, Gurudev, I can't do it. I can't keep up the rounds, please. <laughs> I'm working so hard, I've got a family. I've got no time. And he said, I know how much time you have. You have time. I know what you do with your spare time. Gossip. <laughs> Gossip, he said. If you use that time for chanting, you could finish your 64 rounds. It said, it said that particularly for his grihastas he gave this. He didn't expect it from those who were living in the, in the, in the ashram. He said they're, they're fully engaged in devotional service. They may or may not. They don't absolutely need to. He was flexible. Very flexible. Sometimes you say, okay, but at least chant four rounds. You can sometimes say to people this. Another thing he said was when you chant, <coughs> not very much time to finish this. When you chant, you, uh, it doesn't mean all the beads. He said, you should chant constantly when you're doing your work. That's how you finish your rounds, he said. You just keep chanting when you're driving. We didn't have cars in those days. Not many, a little bit, not much. Whatever you're doing, he said, just keep chanting. This way you can fulfill your vow. The idea was to get into the mood of always chanting. Not, the, not mechanical. 16 rounds finished, right? That's it till tomorrow. I've chanted enough. Don't need to chant again till tomorrow, right? Finish my rounds. Sometimes I'm in a good mood, I might sing. Otherwise, I won't even do that. 16 rounds, finish, bass. That's called offensive chanting. It's one of the types of offensive chanting, to sing like that. Not to do it, but to sing like that. So to try to get us into the mood of always chanting, bees or no bees, but keep chanting, that will gradually awaken a natural, normal, dormant nature, voluntary. So there's a lot of things, and if we had time, I could read for an hour. Just this book, fantastic book, Bhakti Siddhanta. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta by Bhav. It's three volumes, this is just one volume. No time to read from it, it's very sorry. Um, maybe tonight we can read something if you want, I don't know. There's so much nectar. So then he wanted to send, oh, well, before we mention this great event here, um, he started a very revolutionary preaching program called the Diorama Program, doll exhibits, never before seen. All over India he was taking these doll exhibits in big cities, setting them up. Millions of people were coming to see, explaining the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. Very revolutionary. As we heard earlier on, he was very strong. He started or restarted revolution, restarted. Navadweet Parikrama, Vrindavan Parikrama. Great opposition from the caste Goswamis, particularly in Vrindavan. And in, in, in Bengal, also caste Goswamis, Sahajas and different deviant groups. So much opposition. They tried to kill him. They would attack the party with stones and bricks. Very great opposition. They lock all the temples, lock the shops. They tried to bribe some Dakoids to kill him. All kinds of things. Tried to bribe the police so that the police wouldn't interfere. Oh, he faced so many oppositions, but he was fearless. He just carried on, undaunted, preaching. Especially he established these two prikramas, which today, of course, are very, you know, very important part of their world Vaishnav movement. Many things, we're just skipping over many, many things. You could come up with dozens of things along the line. And then a very important time came when it's time to now take that message, not just send it, but send emissaries, persons to the West to preach. So 1931 or two, I can't remember the date. The happy day has come when we are destined to spread the message of our great 
Master, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, to distant corners of the earth. The spiritual service to which we are dedicated has now passed the bud stage, and that willingness which characterized Sri Hanuman when he leapt over the wide ocean with the message of Sri Ram. This extension of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's spiritual gift to foreign countries is our humble offering at his feet. His offering to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to send his disciples overseas. And if you can see it, that's a picture there, um, a photograph. Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj is not on the photograph. There's a photograph of Bon Maharaj. It's back to front. Bon Maharaj was one of the disciples who was sent to the West, although later Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj rejected him. He sent him to the West and he preached in the West. And those other two sitting there with garlands are two Germans, devotees who also became disciples of Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj. One of them, Sadhakara, and later one of them became a sannyasi. On the far, as you see it, I think, on the far left, they just returned. This is a picture in Bombay. They've just returned. This is not going to the West. This is when he came back, when Bon came back, Bon Maharaj came back. And this is a picture in Bombay when they, when they returned on the boat from Germany. And on the far left, I guess as you can see it, with a little moustache, is none other than Abhay Charan. That Narashi Prabhupada sitting there. Very amazing. Another thing which he was very uh, strong on was, uh, of course, India was subjugated by the Westerners, you could say, and their beliefs and what have you. He would preach to big people. And here's a picture God bless the king. <laughs> this is uh, the um, Anderson. He's the, um, what do you call it? The. Um, in, in, in Bengal, he was like the British representative in Bengal. His name was Anderson. Ambassador. Huh? Ambassador. Ambassador, thank you. Like an ambassador of the British. He, his, his name, Anderson. Big man. I think even more than ambassadors, another one above him. And uh, there he is arriving in Mayapur. And Bhakti <laughs> like Siddhartha was not attached to traditions if it didn't achieve the purpose. Whatever achieved the purpose. Now you see those persons dressed up like waiters or something. <laughs> they are Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj's disciples. Some of them are sannyasis because this Anderson, who's the biggest man in, in Bengal, the British, the British side at least. And uh, this is just the way they, they behave. This is how they, they had things. So, he, all these people came there and he was able to, to present the philosophy of Krishna consciousness in a way that they could receive it. And uh, they call it suited and booted. <laughs> he dresses sannyasis up in suits and boots. He called it suited and booted. <laughs> so that's Anderson. There's another picture of him in Mayapur with a group of Westerners and some Whoa. Indians all nicely dressed on the dinner Stay table there. And he was, as I said, he was quite revolutionary in the sense that techniques which would bring people to the origin. Most of these people are addicted meat eaters. He would bring a, a cook from Calcutta to cook meat for them. <laughs> he brought Western toilets to Mayapur so they could poo. Because <laughs> they wouldn't know how to do it, a hole in the ground, they're not used to that. There was the, the the toilet didn't go anywhere. It just went into the ground. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Here he is. Uh, yeah, the governor. It's not the ambassador. The governor of Bengal. That's the word. The governor. He's like the not the king, but he's like the British head. Uh, the governor. That that's mistake. Oftentimes we hear that this is um, uh, this Anderson, but it's not. This is a picture in Dhaka, when he opened the uh, Gaudiya Math. He established 64 Gaudiya Maths throughout India. At that time, Bangladesh was part of India, so was Burma. So uh, Dhaka was one of his main centers in Bangladesh, what is now Bangladesh. 
and that's at the opening of the of the Gaudiya Mass there. And the, these two persons are the chief magistrate and another very big personality of the British government there in, in Dhaka. And they're presenting him with this, what, I don't know what you call it, like a scroll, you can see it on the table there. And this is, a, you know, says from the people of Dhaka, congratulations on establishing the map here. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, doesn't seem so. Another picture here with some more dig dignitaries. Uh, etc etc but the main thing was kirtan wow. and uh, this is outside the uh, altadunga temple there in north calcutta was the harinam sankirtan he this was the main thing he emphasized was harinam sankirtan constant chanting of the holy names of krishna and we'll hear about that if you want tonight it's up to you um, and he also established, we say 64, and the main mutt which was established is this one. This is in a place called Bag Bazaar in Calcutta, where a beautiful temple was built. One of his disciples, Jagabandhu, one of his uh, rich Grihasta disciples, and bought this land and financed the whole building of the temple. Very wonderful devotee, apparently. Everyone loved him. He was so sweet and so kind and humble devotee did his service for his Guru Maharaj. And you see here. Okay, in, in terms of the um, the uh, business of a guru. My friends, rescuers from danger, like Siddhanta wrote. If a Vaishnav does, does not do the work of a guru, then the spiritual Vaishnav lineage will stop. Again, if he does the work of a guru, then he becomes a non-Vaishnava. For if a guru thinks, I am a guru, the first U letter in the word disappears, the word becomes garu or cow. <laughs> Gauru or garu. A real devotee, a real guru does not make disciples and thus remains a guru. As we said earlier, he just becomes a servant of them. Here we see Siddhanta Saraswati giving a very strong warning about entertaining the conception of overlordship or being the master of anyone. He did not. Even he had thousands and thousands and thousands of disciples all over India and a few in Europe. There is with some of his disciples in Dhaka at the opening of that temple. Dhaka. And here's another very old photograph some of his first sannyasas that really is authentic. Very old photograph, it's a real photograph. And there's another one of his revolution, Yukta Varagya. Yukta Varagya means using everything as Krishna's property and using it for his pleasure and showing others how to do it and not rejecting anything that can be used in Krishna's service. So he would go in a car. Quite, he would dress, he would sometimes dress in almost, not Western, he always wear his sannyas dress, but he would sometimes wear Western ja, ja, long coats and things, very smart looking. And really, the Babaji's, particularly in the traditional so called Vaishnavas, they thought, this is terrible, what is this man doing? He's ruining our religion. So, what to speak of driving in a car? He said that when he went to Vrindavan one time, he entered into Radhakun, the most holy place, which is full of Babaji's, in a very fancy English car. He drove in, in this car, unheard of, first time ever. First and then they, okay, that's bad enough. Then they asked him to speak on Rasa, some Krishna's pastime. He spoke on the Upanishads. The Upanishad. They all walked, walked away. He said, he said, they are not residents of Radhakun. They're residents of Narakakut, hellish mentality, seeing themselves in the center as the enjoyers. Not all, but many of them. And sometimes he said, this is the car, this is not the car he drove into Vrindavan. This is the car he used when he went to Naimisharanya, the holy place where the Bhagavatam was spoken. But anyway, he utilized all these various facilities sending his disciples overseas was another revolutionary thing as far as the traditional sannyas is concerned. So he was, the main point was always 
what will help spread Krishna consciousness, what will help release people from their false egos, attachments to you know, renunciation even. And you can become attached to renunciation as another obstacle on the path of devotion. And here's another one which is a little bit misunderstood sometimes. We hear all the time here that Srila Prabhupada asked Srila Prabhupada on the banks of Radhakund, his spiritual master, you see the picture of him walking there, painting the picture, walking on the banks of Radhakund, told him, if ever you get money, print books. Well, it's true that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj did give her Srila Prabhupada that instruction. But it wasn't on the bank of Radhakund, it was in his house. And this is a painting of Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj giving that instruction to Abhay Charan, Abhay Charan at that time, where she would But if ever you get money, print books. And this house is in the village of Radhakun, but not on the banks. My Guru Maharaj's contribution is that he defeated the Casco Swans. He defeated the Brahmanism. He did it in the same way as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did. As Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Kiba Vipra Kiba Nyasi Shuddha Keni Nai Ye Krishna Tattva Veta Se Guru Hai There is no consideration whether one is Sanyasi, Brahmin, Shuddha or Grihastha. No, anyone who knows the science of Krishna, he is all right. He is Goswami and he is a Brahmin. This was my Guru Maharaj's contribution. And for this reason he had to face so many vehement protests from these Brahmins and Castro Swamis. Anyone can be a pure devotee, man, woman, black, white, doesn't make any difference what their birth is. The consciousness. The consciousness. <coughs> and another picture of him in Madras with when he opened the Gaudiya Mass in Madras. And he printing presses, he opened printing presses in Madras, in Krishnanagar, in Calcutta, in different places. The printing press never stopped for a moment. It was printing day and night practically. Publishing books and night literatures, informational literatures like anything. This is one of his Brihat Madanga. Our father said he learned everything from his father except this one thing, book publication. A big thing, Bhakti Siddhartha <coughs> emphasized like anything, the book distribution, the book publication. He said, if any one disciple he said, I'll take the dust from those de feet of those devotees who are actually spreading this mission. This is the greatest thing to him. And he would embrace them, even if only went out and just to be one little magazine. He was so happy. You'd save one soul from going to hell. He was so emphasizing this book distribution and publications. That's where Prabhupada got this. Prabhupada got so much em impetus. And this is the last, said to be the last photograph ever taken of Bhakti Siddhartha Maharaj. Wow. In 1936, you can see he's looking a little old. He was a little bit, he was preparing himself to leave the world, basically speaking, even though he was physically not so old. This is in, maybe in December of 36 or something. And then on early morning of uh, December, January the 1st, 4.30 or something in the morning on this January the 1st, 1937, he decided to leave the world, and uh, that was, and moved on. We're just going to have a look, or uh, no, I think we'll leave it for tonight. If you if you want, we can show the rest of it tonight. Very important instructions, mainly teachings and instructions tonight. Mainly, we're going to finish there. Um, we'll finish with one song. There it is. The night before Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj departed, uh, Siddhanta Maharaj was there, other disciples were there in his room, they were talking. And uh, he'd been a little sick, but he'd been preaching like anything. And he was in Calcutta, in Bhagavazar, in the temple there. And uh, he asked his disciples, he would often stop them when they were trying to show off their musical talents. So he asked Sridhar Maharaj to sing this song, Sri Rupa Manjari Pada, which was his favorite song, practically speaking. And you know, Sridhar Maharaj again was not a musician per se, 
but he sang with devotion. It's the real meaning of kirtan, is devotion. It's not musical talents, it's sweet voice. Use those in Christian service, no doubt, but not in our own service.
Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama, Hare Hare, Hare.